Hey gang, it's been a crazy couple of weeks over here at Dimension 20 Fantasy High Junior Year. We're about halfway through the season, so I think it's time for a quick recap of everything that's transpired over the last 10 episodes. We open the season with the bad kids, exhausted and bedraggled after a summer of endless night, chasing the Night Yorb across Spire in the Red Waste with some of their most loved allies like Aesop, Balthazar, oh, and of course, Squeam. We all remember Squeam, right? After a hard chase and with the help of an ominous power offered to Fig, the bad kids triumph over the Night Yorb, eventually sealing it into a glyph on top of the hang van. Unfortunately, there's no time to celebrate. I'm just gonna throw my phone. As a new email reminds our heroes that junior year begins in just a few days. The bad kids wearily return to Elmville, arriving early in the morning of their first day of school. At Seacaster Manor, Fabian catches his mother and Galir moments before they leave on a vacation. Galir, in an unusual stroke of good luck, won a cruise. Delightful to know the kiss of fortune. Hilario and Galir take off, leaving Fabian alone in the looming Seacaster Manor at the precipice of his junior year. Riz arrives home to find his mom asleep over some embezzlement case files. An exhausted Sklanda greets Riz with the news that she has not retained her pension after quitting Elmville PD to become a public defender. With money getting tighter for the gut gags, Riz will need to depend on scholarships for his college education. You have perfect grades, um, and that still might not be enough. Across town, Jawbone is telling Fig and Kristen that they are both on the verge of failing out of school. It's all mush. When Adine's inheritance from her parents is inaccessible because her mom is not technically dead, Jawbone also breaks the news that Aelwyn has moved out, and both Principal Eggfort and Fig's paramour, Ida Eggfort, have left on a trip through time. Vacation! Unquangling the time quangles Arthur has chronomantically created and experiencing the chronomantic wonders of space and time. In both his and Galir's absences, Eggfort has put a robotic principal, Grix, in charge. Welcome, one and all. Sleep deprived and already overwhelmed, the bad kids arrive for the first day of school, where Riz has been hard at work for hours strategizing on how to help his friends succeed in school. We're just working on the transcripts. Bad kids must all graduate with excellent academic standing as an adventuring party's success is graded together. If even one member drops out, fails, or dies, the entire party gets moved to pass-fail, which will affect their chances at college scholarships. Riz joins every extracurricular available in an attempt to boost his college applications and signs Kristen up as a candidate for next year's student body president. I'm Kristen Applebee's. <laughs> running her campaign as her campaign manager. While the bad kids chat with Maisie Phaedra, this year's president, they meet Kipper Lily Copperkettle. Hi! A junior rug with a chip on her shoulder. She's also running for student body president, and when Fig inquires about her platforms, Kipper Lily makes a few pointed comments about fairness and favoritism. Kipper Lily also informs him that she has already aced junior year, even though it's barely begun, because she found the rogue teacher. The bad kids discover that Kipper Lily is a member of the Rat Grinders, another party in their year. Other members of the Rat Grinders include Buddy Dawn, a high court transfer student who is a devout cleric of Helio, and Reuben Hopclap, a gnomish bard who released the hit Song of the Summer while Fig and Gorga were busy fighting the Night York. At Owlbear tryouts later that day, Riz, Fabian, and Gorgug meet Marianne Scuttle. Okay. Despite her small stature, Marianne is able to nonchalantly knock Gorgug clear across the field and into the bleachers. Who's growl? Focusing on school, Fabian, Fig, and Gorgug discover that they must get multi-class paperwork, the MCAT, signed by their respective teachers. Fabian and Fig both get their MCAT signed immediately, but Porter denies Gorgug's barbarian artificer MCAT. I'm not going to approve you. Henry Hopclap, the artificer teacher, tells Gorgug that without Porter's approval, he'll have to take all three years of artificer tracks on top of his normal barbarian course load. My name's Chloe, guys. In wizard classes, Adine receives an expensive list of required materials, including 10 barrels of diamonds. 10 barrels of diamonds? Not wanting to burden Jawbone, she gets a job at the newly opened mall in the Synod of Spire, working night shifts at Oodles of Strudel. Kristen finally updates her cleric paperwork to reflect Cassandra as her god and seeks her out to apologize for being distant. I'm sorry. But Cassandra, feeling lonely and a little nervous about Kristen's chaotic and avoidant nature, has resubstantiated Kalina, the shadow cat. I'm more of a cat person. Fig attends her first ever bard class, though she does it in disguise and only to spy on Reuben, the bard from the Rat Grinders. She shows up as a tiny emo girl named Wanda Childa. But her flirtations with Reuben are cut short when an agent Clark from the Council of Chosen shows up, searching for missing person Hilda Hilda. As the first week of school draws to a close, Fabian plans the ultimate shrimp party to cement his status as a maximum legend. <laughs> Exhausted, the bad kids try to prioritize their various obligations. Fabian ditches the owlbears to set up his party. Adine has a shift at the mall, but promises Fabian she'll come to the party after. And Kristen accidentally stands Cassandra and Kalina up in order to work on her campaign for student body president, preparing to do a shrimp jump 
at Fabian's party. Anyone for a dip? <laughs> While working your shift at Oodles of Strudel, Adine sees Kalina and Cassandra canvassing for doubt at the Synod Mall. Upon hearing that Kristen has prioritized her student president campaign, Cassandra begins to rage. I'm not happy, Kristen! Glowing red and ejecting a bright red spiky star from her chest as she grows in size. As Adine watches in horror, the red star infects another wizard in the Synod, and he too glows with rage, growing massive and killing his companion. With minutes to go before Fabian's party begins, Adine brings her friends to the mall to help save Cassandra while wizards all around them begin to rage and hulk out. After an intense battle, it seems like the bad kids finally have things under control when a series of freak accidents are set off by a seemingly cursed fig and a rage star infected Kalina. The former shadow cat gives the bad kids Rog Barkrock's name as a clue before turning on her goddess. Turning to rage to stay alive, Cassandra attempts to kill them all, and in an act of desperation, the bad kids are sent back in time to 10 seconds before the start of battle, setting off another time quangle in the Astral Mall. In the continuing timeline, the bad kids stand, shell-shocked, in front of Fabian's house as an eldritch voice taunts Kristen, reconstituting the rotting husk of her old god, Yes. With Cassandra gone and nothing but a handful of twilight shards left of Kristen's goddess, Kristen goes invisible and Fig offers to complete the shrimp jump in disguise as Kristen to kick off her candidacy. I love my friends. <laughs> After a nat 20 shrimp jump, the party begins in earnest. Adine lets loose for the first time and plays beer pong with a hot archer, Ivy, and her cool wizard friend, Oshin. Even frosty bitches! <laughs> Gorgog, meanwhile, attempts to ask Rog about Kalina's final clue. Fuck off! While Rog delights in buttered wrestling with the milieu of Hudal, Mumple, and Eggfort students in attendance. Who's trying to feel like a bad baby? Fabian, Riz, and Fig chat with the new cleric, Buddy Dawn, and discover that the Rat Grinders had a previous cleric, a Frost Genazi named Lucy Frostblade. They meet up with others in Fabian's room to do some research, tearing apart his yearbooks in their search. They discover that Lucy died sometime towards the end of the previous school year, and that Ivy and Oshin are actually rat grinders. The party goes all night, and in the early hours of the morning, Max Durden, who had been smoking Gorgon Fern with the stoners in the basement, tells Fabian that they accidentally broke a Cloud Rider engine and then leaves. As the party winds down, Tracker gives Kristen a call from Falinel, but their conversation turns sour quickly with Kristen exchanging harsh truths with her ex-girlfriend. The next day, the bad kids check in with Lydia Barkrock to see if she knows why Kalina had said Rog's name before vanishing. Lydia doesn't know why the Shadow Cat would be interested in her son, but tells them that Bakur had been trying to resurrect a dead god before Lydia had trapped him within a gem in her chest. She offers them the research from her party's adventure. At a student assembly on Monday, emergency interim principal Grix drug tests the students, netting any students who fail, including Max Durden. The bad kids free Max, who tells them that he got the Gorgon Fern from Ivy, the Rat Grinder's ranger fighter. He also points out that Kipper Lily Copper Kettle hired a bunch of food trucks. They go truck, we don't give a fuck. As her campaign kickoff. The gang agrees the sportsmanly thing to do is to sample the food trucks and thank Kipper Lily. Milady. But as Kristen walks away, Kipper Lily asks about Cassandra's death, loud enough for the assembled students to hear. How can you cast spells? Spell, spell. With the Synod Mall destroyed, Adine begins her second job at Basrar's Soda Fountain, attempting to fend off aggressive elves that teleport to Basrar's to ask her questions as the Elven Oracle. You can start working right away. Fig begins taking Paladin classes with Porter, devoting herself to Christian and Cassandra. Fabian, meanwhile, begins lo-fi study nights at his house, cementing both his and Christian's social statuses as she uses the opportunity to campaign to the gathered students. Kristen is rising in popularity with Riz and Fabian's help, achieving campaign successes even as she continues to struggle academically. In an attempt to improve her grades, Kristen takes some time to attend the cleric teacher's office hours. Yolanda tells her that as long as she and Craig are alive, Cassandra isn't truly dead, though getting her back would likely take a miracle on Kristen's part, without the help of her god. Kristen takes the opportunity to ask about Lucy Frostblade and some god change paperwork Riz finds while investigating. Yolanda insists that Lucy was devoted to her god and would never change her worship. Upon closer investigation, they realize that the space for the name of the god that Lucy was changing her cleric service to is missing. Not blank, but completely absent, like the name itself is missing. Yolanda tells Kristen she'll investigate. Was it to something more positive? At the Thistle Spring Tree, Wilma and Digby prepare to host a community music festival, Frosty Fair. Reuben Hopclap and his band, My Clerical Nomads, are performing. But during their set, 
Principal Griggs attacks Reuben, causing all the technology in the vicinity to go haywire and attack the attendees, including a number of personal machines the Thistle Springs had been working on, much to Gorgug's embarrassment. The lawnmower? <laughs> While battle rages at the Thistle Spring tree, Kristen turns her attention to a vulture that sits regally above the battlefield. When Kristen approaches it, the bad kids are suddenly transported to the vulture dimension, where they meet the vulture king, who tells them they have one single chance to correctly answer the riddle or face death. They succeed and are sent back to Frosty Fair with a number of magic items gifted to them by the Vulture King. Bye. After defeating Principal Grix and the Thistle Springs machines, the bad kids find some odd electrical wiring in the shape of a 24-point star, as if a ritual was completed. They think back to the song Reuben had been singing when he'd been attacked by Grix and realize it had been about rage. Further investigating the rat grinders takes them to the Far Haven Woods, where they discover the bodies of not only Lucy Frostblade, but also Yolanda Badgood, Kristen's cleric teacher. There is an unreadable rune etched into their chests, blocking any possibility of bringing them back to life. But Kristen kneels beside them, taps into her doubt, and performs a miracle, freeing Yolanda and Lucy's souls from the rune trapping them. In doing so, Kristen feels Cassandra's presence again for a moment and receives a clue. The words, I stung her. After anonymously reporting the bodies, the bad kids focus on their obligations. Riz brings a soil sample from Yolanda and Lucy's graves to the president of Eggfort's soil club, asking him to analyze it. Gorgug finally gets Porter to sign his MCAT. Resign figs. <laughs> And the bad kids discover that unless the school can replace Yolanda before the next semester, all of Eggfort's clerics will likely be moved to a pass-fail track, including Kristen. The only way for the bad kids to avoid pass-fail on all of their records is by taking the last standard exam, a test offered for students who need to prove academic achievement after extenuating circumstances. Adine and Aylwin catch up at Basrar's while Adine is working, and Aylwin reveals that she's been running errands for Kipper Lily Copper Kettle on the side to make some money. While researching, Adine also discovers a gap in the pantheon of giant gods where the unnamed god used to be, and Kristen has a tough conversation with Buddy Don, who is recommending his grandfather, a preacher of Helio, come to Eggfort to replace Yolanda as the cleric teacher. Riz checks in with Sklanda, who is extremely worried about her son's workload and lack of sleep. She tells him her embezzlement case was dismissed because her clients, the Loams, were murdered. Sklanda offers to get some info from her old Elmville PD colleagues, and she and Riz make plans to check out Loam Farms. Hilariel calls Fig and invites the bad kids and their families to Kyla Minura for the Moon or Yulnir. Hilariel tells Fig that Galir has been doing unusually well, winning a raffle and growing two inches taller. Between classes, Maisie tells Fabian that she's been made acting principal now that Grix is gone. Fabian, fearing for her safety, invites her over after school. Do you want to come over after school? But when she leans in for a kiss, Fabian reacts poorly, and Maisie, mortified, leaves Seacaster Manor in a hurry. Fig, disguised as Juan Tachilda, runs into Reuben on the bus and tries to draw a reaction out of him by talking about Lucy Frostblade and her unsolved murder. She tells him she'll get him on a podcast to talk about the case, and then Misty steps away as Agent Clark swoops down, looking for her once again. And that's what you missed on Fancy High Junior Year. Tune into episode 11 this Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Bye, girlie. <laughs>